Afternoon, brethren. Sister Leslie and I are very happy to be here with all of you, uh, renewing some former acquaintances, I won't say older, and uh, meeting some new brethren of ours, so we're really glad to be here. Uh, bring love from the New Orleans class with whom I meet. It's one natural family, the Chatters family, uh, of old, some 16 siblings that I've been with for 42 years, and also from the Mississippi Bible students, which consists of my wife and I and Sister Barbara McLaughlin, who we affectionately refer to as Muffin. Uh, you might have heard uh, just Sister Sharon Keenast's uh, testimony yesterday and uh, regarding her daughter, Tess, in her early 30s, who is struggling with some severe neuroendocrine cancer, stage four. And she's, uh, the update is that she's back in the hospital and they had to drive because she was not in any condition to uh, withstand a uh, plane trip to Tulsa, Oklahoma. And the cancer is worse on the liver and a mass has developed on the right side, uh, uh, behind her liver, uh, on the right muscle rather in the back and it's causing pain. And uh, they're going to need to start uh, restart the chemotherapy uh, earlier than they'd hoped to. They were trying to stabilize her uh, gastrointestinal system, but they had to move ahead. So please keep them in our prayers. Uh, they uh, are really struggling with that situation. They are very dear to us, uh, Leslie and I, because we meet uh, monthly and have had um, the... 35-year experience association with them. The topic uh, I selected uh, for today is uh, Know Thyself, and it comes from uh, an expression that Socrates made uh, some many years ago. He said, Know Thyself, the unexamined life is not worth living. Well, later on in history, Shakespeare wrote a play called Hamlet, and uh, I was kind of in high school, I was a uh, senior uh, and did a term paper on Shakespeare and and uh, thought that he didn't write half the stuff that they said he did, but I didn't get a very good grade because my student teacher was a real fan of Shakespeare. But he wrote a play, or at least it's called, uh, that he did, called Hamlet, and uh, in, in, that, uh, in that play, one of the characters, uh, Polonius, uh, quotes, makes the statement, to thine own self be true. So, and a partial quote of this uh, is, to thine own self be true, and it must follow as the day, the night, thou canst not be false to any man. Well, this implies that as long as you don't deceive anybody else, then you won't be tempted more than likely to deceive other people. And a fuller quote of the quote goes, Of all knowledge, the wise and good seek most to know themselves. Thou sleepst, wake and see thyself. The fool doth think he is wise, but the wise man knows himself to be a fool. This above all, to thine own self be true, and it must follow as the day the night, thou canst not be then false to any man. I know myself now, and I feel within me a peace above all earthly dignities, a still and quiet conscience. Well, there's some profound wisdom in, in those words. And uh, the question is before us, why should we know ourselves? Um, should we, you know, um, employ some kind of introspective thinking? I mean, as Bible students, we know these answers. Should we compare ourselves to a higher power motive? Of course, that's why we're here this week. This is what God gave us intellect and free will to do in the development of the new creature. But the world, on the other hand, tells us ignorance is bliss. In a February 27, 2010, study done at Washington University in St. Louis, uh, it revealed, and I quote, humans have long been advised to know thyself, but new research suggests we may not know ourselves as well as we think we do. 
While individuals may be more accurate at assessing their own neurotic traits, such as anxiety, it seems friends and even strangers are often better barometers of traits such as intelligence, creativity, and extroversion. End of quote. In this world of self-actualization, we're told to know ourselves for the purpose of elevating self for professional reasons and to be a better salesman in whatever field or in, of endeavor. After we learn who we are, then we're told we need to accept ourselves and that there's really no good or bad personality. But Manfred de Vries, in a 2010 article for the magazine Family and Relationships, wrote, and I quote, Self-awareness is never a learnable skill that with some direction, time, and effort we can get better at. It's not an all-or-nothing proposition, but choice before us is how far along that continuum we are willing to go. Unfortunately, most of us are are too easily satisfied and quit too soon. We have default ways of thinking that help us to pervert, preserve the status quo because that's where we're most comfortable. This is how we get in the way of our own growth and happiness. DeVries goes on to say, part of the problem is our propensity to fool ourselves. It's a willful blindness about 150 years after Thales Thales of Miletus, one of the sages of ancient Greece, Socrates came along and reminded his audience that self-deception is the worst thing of all. Before him, the Hebrew prophet Jeremiah had said, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Jeremiah 17.9, English Standard Version. And he offered a, a lament, I know, O Lord, that the, man, the way of a man is not in himself, that it is not in man who walks to direct his own steps, Jeremiah 10, 23. In other words, we can't even trust our own minds because the human mind is incapable of seeing things in a completely honest, straightforward manner. We hide things from ourselves. Denial and its compa companion blame are the leading cause for our lack of self-awareness. It is an ever-present force that thwarts our ability to see ourselves as we are. After all, when we find out who we are, we might not like the person we find. End of quote. Well, as the psychologist said, um, the scriptures did teach early about the subject, and we we read in 17.9 that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? In verse 10, I, I, the Lord, search the heart, try the reins, or test the mind, as the New American Standard says, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. In verse 9, the word, the word deceitful comes from Strong's number 6121, which is taken from a root word, 6117, meaning to seize by the heel, as if to trip up by the heels. And this suggests to our minds the experience of the events in the life of Jacob. We all know the story of how Jacob, in the womb, grabbed his brother Esau by the heel as they were both being brought into the world and how Jacob tricked or deceived Esau into giving up his birthright for a mess of pottage. And we further know of Jacob's tenacity in wrestling with the angel to the break of day when the angel finally blessed him as he desired. But sometime later, Jacob had deceit practiced upon him by his uncle Laban when he thought, uh, thought he had taken Rachel to wife but received her sister Leah. So Jacob, notwithstanding his paternal significance, was a picture of double dealing ent entrepreneurial spirit that moved him through his life. We can only wonder how, in using deceit, that he might have been deceived himself. 
King David admonished his son Solomon on the occasion of announcing him heir to the throne over Israel, telling him in 1 Chronicles 28.9, And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts, if thou seek him, if thou will, he will be found of thee, but if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. Oh, we read in Psalm 7, 9, Oh, let the wickedness of the wicked one, wicked, come to an end, but establish the just, for the righteous God tries the hearts and the reins. And in speaking of reigns, we read in Psalm 16, verses 7 through 8, that I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. My reigns also instruct me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. God's counsel and the reins he places on us keeps us on the straight and narrow path which leads to eternal life. Sister Leslie and I have some property north of the coast in Mississippi, and we have some horses on our property back there. And um, and I see firsthand the result of using leather reins with metal bits to control the horse. You know, the horse is, you know, many times our size and weight, yet they move immediately upon the application of the proper reining. The bits are put into their mouths in order to control them, and perhaps we should have the same controls put upon us. James 2, excuse me, James 3, verses 2 and 3 come to mind where we read, For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able to bridle the whole body. And we turn about, behold, we put bits in the whole, in the horse's mouth that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Our Lord in glory introduced, instructed John to write to the angel of the church at Thyatira, Peter Waldo, warning him against ecclesiasticism and the increasing priestcraft, and where we read in Revelation 2.23, and I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and the hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. I enjoyed, incidentally, reading the latest version of the Herald magazine with all of the uh, interesting facts about our spiritual forefathers and uh, about Waldo and Thy uh, and uh, Huss and Wycliffe and Luther. It was very interesting, some things I didn't know, but uh, kudos to the PBI. We read in uh, reprint 2038, 2038-5, that Christians above all things guard themselves against the folly of this way. To do this, let us ever remember that even through Christ we have a reckoned standing of justification before God. The human heart which we still have is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, as we've read in Jeremiah. And it requires constant watching and purging to enable us to put into practice the Apostle Paul's rule in simplicity and godly sincerity, have your conversation in the world, 2 Corinthians 1.12. To do this requires humility, sobriety, and godliness. If the heart be puffed up with pride or ambitious for vainglory, or if it be selfish or in any measure intoxicated with the spirit of the world, then beware, for there is great danger of getting into that way that seemeth right, to a man because blinded by his own perverse will or fleshly mind. The best safeguard which a Christian can have against the snares of Satan is that understanding which is here in Psalm 4, excuse me, Proverbs 4, verse 22, 
described as a wellspring unto him that hath it. Such understanding is not merely of the head, but of the heart, specially, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and out of the heart are the issues of life. If the heart be wrong, the head will seek to justify it, and in so doing will pervert judgment and truth. Therefore take heed and keep thy heart with all diligence. Proverbs 4.23, end of quote. And we need to try to remember, if we're going to be brutally honest about ourselves, which is nothing less than that would be acceptable to our Lord, to not get discouraged when we learn the truth about ourselves. For after all, it is God's will for us for our sanctification, and that includes trials and testings. And as the convention theme tells us, we're God's workmanship. So we should be approving the process that he uses with us to enlighten us and to uh, bring our faults before us for, uh, for improvement. So let us consider how our Heavenly Father wants to self -examine, us to self-examine and consider our ways and make changes in our life. The, apostle, the prophet Haggai calls our attention to a period in the history of Israel where they were counseled of our Father to consider their ways. We read in Haggai 1, verses 5 through 7, Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways, ye have sown much, and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth, excuse me, he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put into a bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. He says it twice in those texts. And Rotherham renders it, apply your heart to your own experience. Since it was repeated to Israel, it bears some attention to us in our personal lives. Israel, as we know, had a reputation for having fallen out of obedience to God multiple times and needing upbraiding constantly. So do we, for that matter. The occasion for them in this, dis uh, in this instance was the rebuilding of the temple and during the reign of Darius Hestapes, that they, we know they had no king of their own. The work of the temple of rebuilding had ceased. Uh, we read in Ezra 4, verse 24, then ceased the work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem. So it ceased unto the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. The work had stopped at the foundation walls and they had, to, they had to cease construction because the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin had protested. The adversaries, they initially wanted to participate in the construction, but they were told no because um, they were told no. And uh, Zerubbabel and Jeshua, Yeshua and the rest of the chief of the fathers uh, of Israel said no way. And from that time on, the adversaries frustrated the building process. Our, the, uh, the adversaries uh, issued a formal protest letter, and it was sent to King Artaxerxes. They threatened to stop paying tolls and tributes in Ezra 4.13. So the work stopped for a period of 16 years until the second reign of Darius, or Darius, I'll pronounce it both ways. So it came time for Haggai to shake them up and point them to a more introspective look at their lives for the purpose of serving God, whom they had ignored for some time. So brethren, you know, do we, like the Israelites of then, do we go about in our lives in such a manner that we don't consider our ways and whether they please the Lord? Even in our routine activities, in our ecclesias, and our fellowship with one another, do we stop? to think, does this please our Heavenly Father? Our approach to Him should be as 
expressed in Lamentations 3, verses 40 through 41. Let us search and try our ways and turn again to the Lord. Let us lift up our hearts with our hands unto God in the heavens. Scriptures speak of our Heavenly Father's knowledge of us in Psalm 139, verses 1 through 6. We read, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down-sitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassed my, compassest my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. In the same chapter, we read of an invitation for God to check us out in Psalm 139, 23, and 24, where we read, Search me, O God, and know my heart, and try me, and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. And this is not really to be a a one-sided learning about our characters. God doesn't do all the work in the process. And as we've heard expressed before from the podium this week, we have a role to play, as James 4.8 expresses it, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. He already knows us. Now we just need to know ourselves so we can work and complete his purposes. In reprint 2093, we read that, quote, we have to be on guard against the intoxicating spirit of the world, its interests. We heard some of that discussion in the panel discussion this morning, but how to cope in, with all of the uh, temptations and all of the uh, sideline interests in the world. It's our duty to set a vigilant guard. The Christian has covenanted with God to live apart from the world with all its com ambitions, pride, and vainglory, and apart, too, from its selfishness, greed, and strife. The psalmist tells us in Psalm 19:12, who can understand his errors? Then he follows up with the petition to God, cleanse thou me from secret faults. The New American Standard uh, renders it, acquit me from my uh, secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins, and not let them not have dominion over me. The commentary, Jameson Fawcett Brown uh, states on these verses, the clearer our view of the law, the more manifest are our sins. Still, for its full effect, we need divine grace to show us our faults, acquit us, restrain us from the practice, and free us from the power of sin. Thus only can our conduct be blameless and our words and thoughts acceptable to God. And what are our secret faults? Those are, those are characteristics that are not seen maybe by our associates and, and maybe not by our own selves. When we recognize these secret faults, we want the Word of God to take it away from our consciousness. The poet Ralph Waldo Emerson gave us a quote, If you sow a thought and you reap an action, sow an act and you reap a habit. Sow a habit and you reap a character. Sow a character and you reap a destiny. Well, brethren, we know our destiny, don't we? The scriptures tell us the same thing in Galatians 6, uh, verse 7. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And the word deceived in that scripture uh, comes from 4106, which means um, go astray. 
And, and it doesn't mean an innocent or an unconscious acceptance of a wrong on our part. Uh, these uh, secret faults can be things we have allowed ourselves to participate in that are not pleasing to him. So we should well remember the words of Psalm 50, verses 21 through 22. These things hast thou done, and I kept silence. Thou thoughtest that I was one altogether such as one as yourself, but I will reprove thee and set them in order before thine eyes. Now consider this, that ye forgot God, forget God, lest I tear you in pieces and there be none to deliver. So God's not impressed with our empty words, only by our, by our intentions followed by real actions. And we need to also know that by the apostle's statement in Hebrews 4, 13 and 14, always remember that all things are naked unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. We're in the school of Christ and he's our professor. And we read further in reprint 2094, yes, it is in the diagnosis of our case that we are most likely to err. And it is here that sobriety of mind and meekness are so much needed. Self-love does not like to admit the faults that are in us. And to particularize them and to look them squarely in the face with the searchlight of God's word clearly revealing them. It is much more conducive to complacent ease of mind to generalize and to overlook particulars, to say, yes, I know I'm not perfect, and so forth, but it requires a great deal more of moral courage to say, yes, I see now in the light of God's word that I've been selfish or unkind or unfaithful to my obligations or whatever the fault may be. It requires meekness, humility, to admit these things, even to oneself, and still more to confess them to those who have been injured or grieved by them. Yet how necessary are the recognition and the confession, the proper diagnosis of the case, to the healing? Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another, says the Apostle Paul, uh, James, that you may be healed James 5.16. The recognition and the confession as well as the prayer are thus seen to be in very important in order that the heart may be in the proper attitude to receive an answer to the prayer. End quote. So brethren, let us be sober and, and watch unto prayer and let the burden of our prayer be as the psalmist expressed it in verse 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. <coughs> the Apostle Paul says it for us in this way in 2 Corinthians 9, 6. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. We read earlier in Proverbs 4.23 that we should keep our hearts with all diligence. And so how do we keep our hearts? Well, through simplicity and godly sincerity, as we're told in 2 Corinthians 1.12. For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you word. And also, we can keep our hearts by understanding. Psalm uh, Proverbs 16, verse 22, tells us that understanding is a wellspring of life to him that hath it, but the instruction of fools is, is folly. Proverbs 4, 7 sets forth the relationship between understanding and wisdom in stating, Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom, 
and with all thy getting, get understanding. A correct understanding of ourselves, our fallen flesh, should lead us to discipline our thoughts and actions so we can maintain a just position with our Heavenly Father. Job said, I know it is so of a truth, but how should man be just with God? Job 9.2. That was a pretty profound question for that time, given the questions he had been receiving at the hands of his friends. Uh, but we do know through Jesus Christ our Lord, John 3.16, we have justice, our just position with God. You know, the, the scriptures tell us that our flesh and our hearts fail. Psalms 20, 73 verse 26. But God is the strength of our heart and our portion forever. However, it's not good for us to any way excuse ourselves using this statement of the psalmist by saying, well, this, this is just my way, you know, my flesh and my heart fails me, but that's just the way I am. And uh, there was an article I found in reprints in 705 that was titled just this, It Is My Way. And it goes, uh, many people, when reproved for an improper word or action, excuse or justify themselves by saying, it is my way. Is this a proper ground for justification? Let us see what the scriptures say about it. The Lord says, amend your ways. Jeremiah 7, 3. If our ways are not right, they should be amended and not justified. The weeping prophet says, let us search and try our ways and turn again to the Lord. Lamentations 3, 40. The Lord calls us to consider our ways in Haggai 1, verses 5 and 7, which we've already considered. So by careful consideration of our, our ways may not appear excusable. But the fact that certain ways are our own ways should be no excuse for retaining them, but rather a reason for rejecting them. If we should honor God, we would not do so, we would not do our own way, Isaiah 58, 13. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord, Isaiah 55, 8. Of the wicked, he says, destruction and misery are in their ways, Roman 3.16. In pleading with Israel, he says, thou shalt remember thy ways and be ashamed, Ezekiel 16.61. The psalmist asks, wherewith all shall a young man cleanse his way? And the answer is given, by taking heed thereto according to thy word, Psalm 119.9. His own experience is given in verse 104. Quote, Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. The law of God is a detector of false ways. Therefore, we should test all our ways by it. If we are not in harmony with this rule, let us not extenuate nor follow them, but ask for the old paths where is the good way, and walk therein, Jeremiah 6, 16, end of quote. But on the contrary, what a comforting thought to know our Heavenly Father has so provided for us that in our tempor temporal failings, there's an eternal salve to encourage us. We've been given the reassurance that there is no temptation that has taken us, but is such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that ye may be able to bear it. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. We read in the sixth volume, page 60, 161, permitting us to stumble may be his means <clears throat> at times for teaching us valuable lessons respecting our own weaknesses and our need to look unto him as our shepherd, as well as our redeemer, and to feel our own weaknesses, that thereby we may become stronger in the Lord and in the power of his might. He is held out before us as our high priest, capable of being touched with the feeling of our infirmities, 
while possessing full power to succor us in the hour of temptation. He is specifically mentioned as having compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way and being able to save to the uttermost those who approach the Father through his advocacy and who continue to abide in him in living faith, which implies obedience to the extent of ability. Thus we are to rejoice in our Redeemer as a present Savior, deliverer as well as the by and by deliverer from the tomb by a resurrection, the finisher of our faith. End of quote. One way to keep our hearts uh, also is to not think more of ourselves. Uh, as, as we're told in Romans 12:3, uh, the apostle says, For I think through grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more than highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. For we know, as Proverbs 23, 7 expresses, that he, for as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. I would suggest maybe that the enemy, our de the devil, might know us at times better than ourselves, or at least takes note of our actions that he might pursue us over and over in our weakness. Because the apostle Peter tells us to be sober, to be vigilant, and be, because our adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may desire. Well, I will skip the part I was going to say about Judas, because we've got, what, five more minutes? Okay. Self-deception. That's a practice we've got to avoid, and we've got to understand how we deceive ourselves. We got, we've got to know what our weaknesses are, and we've got to know what are we willing to accept as truth. What baseline do we use for evaluating information that comes into us daily, especially as it pertains to our walk with the Lord? And do we always have that baseline of accepting only thus saith the Lord? Regarding self-deception, we read in 1 John 1, 8, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And to make the issue abundantly clear, the records tell us in Ecclesiastes 7.20 that there is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. And James tells us in Roman, uh, James 3.2, and the Rotherham renders it, For oft are we stumbling, one and all. If anyone in word doth not stumble, the same as a mature man, able to curb the whole body. And Romans 3.23, we all know, For all of sin have come short of the glory of God. You know, when we first came to Jesus, we had to admit that we were sinners. And this took an honest assessment of ourselves much like Haggai admitted, uh, admonished the Israelites to, of old to do. I know as myself, I was a Catholic, and it, 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 you know, coming to grips with the idea of the term a sinner was somewhat foreign to me. I knew about sin, and I knew about how to get rid of it by going to confession and so forth, but coming to an understanding of the legal term and, and then just what, why I needed the Lord was, um, uh, was, a, was a turning point. So, brethren, in closing, let's uh, close praising our Heavenly Father who has called us out of darkness and into His marvelous light. He's given us the earnest of our inheritance, the Holy Spirit, to guide us all the way through our consecrated walk. What a priceless gift. And we'll close with a quote that Ben Franklin made. Um, he said, uh, Search others, for their virtues, thyself for thy vices. And may the Lord add his blessing.